Hello and welcome back to another video blog. Sorry this didn't come out on Tuesday, but um, I'm quite sick at the moment. You might better tell it for my voice. My voice isn't sounding the best. So, really what this is, um, is cleaning a lemon. I took some still life pictures last week um, using, obviously, my what I, what I sort of call my daylight studio, but I don't really like calling it a daylight studio because it sort of sounds a little bit like... Um, uh, a little lazy, I suppose, but um, I'm really starting to get into still life photography, and I said this before, but it's something which I'm sort of starting to enjoy a lot, and it's something I enjoyed when I was originally studying photography. Before I went down the landscape route, and I don't know why I went down that route, even in retrospect, um, I do like landscape photography, I'm not going to say I don't, so, uh, but still life photography, really, it's starting to really be like the main thing I'm doing at the moment and I'm looking to actually get some proper studio uh, kit set up um, so I can control the light better. I think that's the, the thing really. The great thing about having a daylight studio is that you can pretty quickly uh, set up an image and shoot it. I think the only problem is that you have to somehow control this light. Um, I do have my flash that I can use off camera um, which is useful you know for a bit of filling in um, I have the reflectors and things like this, but if I wanted to sort of uh, create an image with like a balanced light, so this I call it the Rembrandt lighting, you know, from both sides equally balanced, um, it would be quite hard to do it using a daylight uh, sort of setup. And so I am looking into you know maybe getting some kit to enable me to do this a little bit more, a little bit easier. Um, and then I can sort of maybe also be a little bit more creative in what I do at the moment. At the moment, I'm just using a black uh, black background. I did try and use um, uh, backlighting, uh, which I'll have to do on the show another post, uh, which was quite interesting, the outcome on that. Uh, so in this particular image, uh, it's of a lemon, which you've just seen. And uh, it's actually a lemon which has been cut in half. And one half of it had been wrapped, and so it, uh, the... Uh, being kept away from the air, basically. And the other one had sort of, uh, the other part had just become uh, shriveled as it dried out. Uh, so what I did, I, I sort of used these two as a sort of a concept uh, in the image, really. And uh, I took a few pictures of different different compositions. Um, the one thing I, I did, uh, I, I sort of did, is I, I put I put the this this um lemon face down on the paper. And what happened was. It picked up hairs. Now, I, it's one of those things you you know you look at the black card, you oh that, that's clean, you know it's fine. But there was always some some little hairs, most likely from my dear cat, um, who whenever I do any still life work becomes extremely interested in it and likes to walk around it. Uh, so, uh, really, what the big problem was, I love the shot, and it's one of those things I always say to people, you know, if you're gonna do any photography, get it right in the camera, and then your work. Uh, in post-production, drops dramatically. You're just sort of balancing out your colors, you're balancing out your light, and doing some sort of lighting effects. And actually, you know, that was true, actually, just the basic idea of this. I did. But there are hairs everywhere on this. And so it sort of became a thing that I love Adobe Camera Raw, and I love the fact that you can do local adjustments, and you can... There is a spot removal tool. But the spot removal tool isn't that great when you have a long hair that goes across many different textured surfaces. So, um, this had to be loaded into Photoshop to remove that. Um, what it is, I loaded the image in, and I basically duplicate for a new layer. And then in this new layer, I use the clone tool. And I set the clone tool um, with a very, very soft brush. Uh, this is so it, the, the the change and the cleaning process it isn't a hard edge, and in the soft brush, sometimes I I lower the opacity down, um, but that's usually when I'm doing something a little more intricate, and I'm gonna take things from different places to sort of make a new area. And uh, with this one, I kept it at 100%, and I sample from the current layer and the one below. The reason I do this is it basically then takes everything from the smart object and it copies it into this new blank layer. This means it's non-destructive. I'm not actually touching the original image. Um, and I just sort of went around cleaning. Um, there are different sort of cleaning 
techniques I use. I use the I call it the dabbing technique when I sort of sample and sample and click, sample and click. And you sample using Alt. You hold Alt and you sample it. And in like sampling, uh, dabbing, the sort of dabbing sample click motion. Um, you resample the bit of the image you want. You add it and then you sample another X section. This is quite good as you're going along, especially like if you're trying to uh, make it seem quite smooth and smooth it in. Obviously, I could go for a really big brush and just really just stamp it. The problem is with that if you go too big, you um, it can sort of look a little bit strange. It is actually sometimes better to go quite big, but with these hairs, I was very worried about the difference either side. Uh, the other one I uh, I would call is just called the drawing a line. And this one I sample an area and I just draw across. I generally do this when I know there's no sort of difference in tones as much. And you can sort of get away with it. Generally, if you draw a line, I mean, you see it looks massively wrong. You then just click on the on the history section and you just go back. I was a little bit confused as I was actually cleaning this image, actually, because we had... I, I saw the black hairs first. And it's only when you sort of zoom in at 100%. I don't even... In this one, I'm actually zooming in at like 200, 300%. I zoom in so close because I re I really want to make sure everything is you know cleanly done. Maybe that's the best way to say it. A hundred percent. If you click on it, is your print size. So that's how big. Uh, that's how the image should look when it's printed at its full size. Um, and then if you go close, you're obviously going into further details. I always say you should do stuff beyond the print size, and the reason for that is even if it's printed. If someone may have very good eyesight and see something um, a little further in. So we're just going around. This is like this white, this white hair that I saw. And I was like, is it a hair? It must be a hair. So I just sort of like started sampling around. And I did the, the line thing there because I was starting doing it, and it was, I sort of mucked it up a little bit. So I went back to my dabbing motion. <coughs> I thought this is a good thing, actually, just to clean what you cleaned. So you have an area you cleaned it. And this is, uh, so I'm dabbing here, and you'll see sometimes I go back again, and I'll clean an area twice. I'll clean it once using the tool. A bit of pattern matching here. And then I'll go back over it again. Um, you can also use the heel tool. I quite like the heel tool. Um, the only thing I'll say about the heel tool is, um, is in, when it's this intricate like this, it may give you more of a blurrier um, effect. The one great thing about the heel tool is when you use um, content aware, and that's um, I'm not sorry, that's with the patch tool. With the patch tool, you can use content aware, and you can sort of uh, circle an area and then uh, copy it, and it should try and match it. And uh, content aware is that something you really need to play around with just to sort of really understand its limitations because all these tools obviously have their limitations. But the best thing would have been for me to dust this off before I shot it. Um, it's really one of those sort of silly things. So I'm just now just going around and just sort of keep cleaning it. The cleaning process actually is quite, it, it, it does take quite a while. Um, obviously this is just a video of me cleaning it so you're actually getting it quite in real time. It actually took uh, about 20 minutes to half an hour to clean the whole thing. So you got like a 10 minute sort of preview of what it's like to, what it was like for me to go in and clean it. As you can see, I'm switching around quite a bit, like zooming and zooming out. Um, obviously you can use, you can zoom in and zoom out with the, with your tool. Uh -huh, there's my cleaning on the line. Look quite, work quite well there. And actually, I left a little bit of the hair in, if you notice, because it actually matched quite well to the orange. So I was like, well, it sort of, it sort of will work. Oh, that's one of the little tricky bits. I didn't clean, there's lots of marks on the, on the uh, lemon in the background, but they are marks which are from, which are on the lemon. They actually part of the lemon, these sort of black marks. So I left them in, I didn't really care too much about that. It's never quite far away for that one. Uh, so yeah, so well, I'm not going to show you the whole sort of cleaning process. Uh, it took a little bit extra time. Once I had finished cleaning, I 
group those, I highlight those two LEDs and create a new smart object out of both of them. Um, so I could continue with my editing. And this is the image I got to. All I did is I've sharpened the image, um, uh, reduced some noise, and toned it to the film I would have used if I was shooting this in film. And I sort of like doing this. This is sort of one of the things I like to do a lot, which is uh, try and match the colors to a possible film stock. And so this is Progo 400. That's uh, right, Progo 1. No, 100. Yeah, Progo 100 I matched it to um, using Alien Skin. And it has a nice sort of effect. So here is the lemon after it's been cleaned. Um, Please, if you want to follow my blog, I do post regularly, but I haven't over the last couple of days because obviously my lovely sexy voice I have at the moment. And uh, you can find me at aperture64.wordpress.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, which is at aperture64. And I'm also on Facebook, which is aperture64. Uh, Facebook.com forward slash aperture64. And I hope uh, you'll tune in for another episode next week. Bye-bye.